Little Copenhagen. We're going to show the world that we can build some big things. The New York Times. Maybe they will write an article about us, you know, on their front page. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be something if they did that? Yeah? All right, gift. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Life Size City YouTube channel. I'm Michael, urban designer, author, and host of the series. Today we're not going to stray very far. We're going to go on a little trip into my own backyard. And just let me say, welcome to Copenhagen, where an elite group of developers, real estate magnates, engineers, architects, and dorky politicians who are bedazzled by smoke and mirrors continue to try to force mega projects down the throats of the citizens and then ask them to pay for it. What an amazing town. In my work as an urban designer in cities around the world and through my work as the host of the Life Size City, I have seen some amazing things, but I've also seen some crazy shit. And the last place I expected to see it was right here in my own backyard. The latest mega project proposal we're seeing here in Copenhagen is something that you would expect to see in a place like Dubai or Saudi Arabia. Mind-blowing delusions of grandeur. There are three mega projects on the go. One is happening, two are proposed, but I'm going to cover one of them here today. Now in the season two episode of The Life Size City from here in Copenhagen, this is how I wrapped up the whole episode. This is a city that works much better than most other cities on the planet. But I find it reassuring that this is not a finished masterpiece. This is very much a work in progress. There has never been a perfect city and there never will be. But it is the quest that is paramount. We have to continue to think, to design, to innovate, to try and create a place that is just a little bit better than it was yesterday. And using the citizens at every step of that process is absolutely the best way to do that. Oh. I wish my kids still looked at me like that. But yeah, I also wish that a lot of the things I said about Copenhagen in the outro of that episode were still actually true. Lunetaholm is the name of the latest mega project proposal here in Copenhagen, an artificial island at the head of the harbor. Now, Aholm is a Danish word for a low-lying island, an islet, if you like. The word actually exists in English as well. Lunetta, I guess if you're looking at it with English eyes, it just looks like Lynette. Yeah, well, that's the name of your uh, bartender down at your local country and western joint. But hey, as an urban designer, I have quite a few issues with this project. I have bored myself stupid over the holidays reading a 684-page report about the impact of the project. Now, to be honest, I probably didn't read every single page, but I read a whole bunch of it. All the relevant things to me and my work and the impact of this on our city. This is, first and foremost, a real estate project. Let's be absolutely clear about that. This is about making land so some people can make lots of money. But it is so big, massive, in your face, this project. For such a small city as Copenhagen, a small country like Denmark, that many people have a hard time looking at it rationally. You see it all over the place in social media and in the press here. You know, the Danes are going, oh, yes, 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 look at that. Little Copenhagen, little Denmark. We're going to show the world that we can build some big things. We made a little metro, you know. We didn't need it at all, but we just did it because we can. Big mega projects that's going to make them notice us out there in the world. Maybe the New York Times, maybe they will write an article about us, you know, on their front page. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be something if they did that? Yeah, all right, gift. I mean, uh, it is so exciting to be a part of this, you know, uh, even even though I don't really understand much of it at all. But how do kids, man? But we know it's something called optimism bias. And we also know that it's something called technological sublime. Mega projects that are captivating to politicians and citizens because of the massive scale. But anyway, here is the lowdown about the project. The estimated price for this artificial island will be 25 billion Danish kroner. That's about 3.4 billion euros. To create this land in the harbor, it's going to take 80 million tons of dirt. To get that dirt to the harbor, we're going to need 87,000 trucks a year carrying that dirt. You know what that means? That means 72 trucks every hour for 10 hours a day rumbling through the streets of Copenhagen for 30 years. Yeah, sorry, I'm just going to jump in there for a sec. 30 years. <laughs> and here's the map of where all the trucks are going to be driving. 
This is coping trucking right there, man. And uh, I wouldn't want to live anywhere near that, which is basically the entire city. And the project will be finished in 2070. It's going to take 50 years to build. Now, all the communication about this project is coming out of the offices of a company called Bürohaum. City and Harbor. It's a company owned by the city of Copenhagen and their sole purpose, their raison d'etre is to make a lot of money on real estate to pay off the silly little metro that we built 20 or so years ago. Somebody dug them a big hole of debt and uh, their entire job every single day when they go to work is trying to crawl out of it. Now, instead of the silly metro, we should have put in our tramway system, you know, reestablish that like cities around Europe it would have cost a tenth of the price. But that's not what this video is about today. So yeah, whenever you read the communication about this project, you got to take it with a big grain of salt because this is a company intent on making money on real estate. It's like the guy selling snake oil down at your local town market back in the day. In all of their communication, they've been writing, it is coming. This is a thing that will be there. No doubt about it. But there is a lot of doubt about it. It isn't even finalized at this point. All of this communication is just smoke and mirrors. And everything that they write and say is just repeated ad nauseum by politicians and everybody else in the related industries. Now these are the three categories to their spin doctoring. First of all, there's a housing shortage and crazy population growth. Now there is a housing shortage, especially affordable housing. But the whole plan here rests on the fact that expensive plots of land on the artificial island have to be sold in order to try and offset the price of the island. These won't be affordable homes at all. They will be more of the same fancy homes that we see being slapped up all over the place. Across the harbor, the new development of Nohaun is still being developed, but already there, the prices for homes are among the most expensive in Denmark. So this will be yet another housing development for people with means. And then we hear about the whole population growth angle. Oh my God, all these people are moving here every single year. It is a major part of the narrative. But the data over the past few years, suggests that this isn't any longer the case. People are leaving the city. Population growth is not as high as it has been before. And a lot of this is because of unaffordable and inadequate housing. 25% of new developments have to be affordable housing in Copenhagen. But with this project, I've read that they won't be built until the 75% where the money is, is established. And that will take 50 years. The next category in the spin narrative is traffic congestion. That Copenhagen suffers from too many cars is not news. But plans for Lunetohump show that 15% of the artificial island will be car parking. So there go all hopes for creating the world's most sustainable development. One right-wing politician even said that, oh, this project needs four-lane roads or else we can't sell the properties at a high price. Add to that the Danish Ministry of Transport's expectation that the number of cars in Copenhagen and Denmark will continue to grow exponentially. From 2.6 million today to the projected 3.5 million in 2030. Car sales have been breaking records for the past four years. It's cheaper to buy a car now than during the oil crises in the 1970s. Between 2014 and 2018, there has been a 31% increase in car ownership in Copenhagen. That's 11,775 new cars in this city every single year. And nobody is doing anything about it. And along with this fake island, the developers, oh, they really want a motorway tunnel. <laughs> Seriously, in 2021, they are completely ignorant to the concept of induced demand. Now, here's a little video. It's going to take two minutes. I'm going to put it here because it is incredibly relevant to this. And it's also really funny. By ingesting the 12 months worth of data you sent, that's about two terabytes worth. Wow. What you're looking at now is a typical midweek traffic flow. Green is good, orange indicates slower than average, red is heavy. Now we can manually input a range of external factors. Wet weather, public holidays, RDOs for the industrial sector. Breakdown on a major arterial. That's pretty impressive. So we've taken your project. The road upgrade, extra lanes, on and off ramp lengthening. We factored in all those improvements. So starting with current flow during peak, then during construction, some problems. Of course. And then when it opens, oh, that's brilliant. Amazing. And with the machine learning, we can keep it going. Year two, year three, year four. Wait, wait, what's going on? What happened? Where'd the green go? What happened? Why does the traffic get worse? Have you heard of the Jevons paradox? I'm hoping they're a death metal band. It basically states that the better you make something like a road, the more people will use it. Isn't that a good thing? No, it means you spend a lot of money now for a very short term benefit. So there is some benefit. Oh, sure. Average travel times crossing the city will be cut by two and a half minutes or a little less. Call it two. Really? And that lasts for 14, 15 months. Then declines. Uh, no, stays flat. Then declines. 
Well, for $300 billion, I guess we were hoping for something a little more dramatic. Two and a half minutes. Call it two. You don't look happy. And one lie is repeated constantly. That a tunnel will reduce the number of cars in the center of Copenhagen. Nowhere in the world has that ever happened over the past 100 years. More roads mean more cars. Seriously, you can't say this enough. More roads means more cars. Period. Well, there's one thing that we haven't heard too much about at all. There are currently preliminary studies underway about how to increase capacity on the main motorways around Copenhagen. Like most of them. If these people are allowed to build their tunnel, they want to increase capacity elsewhere. They're even talking about expanding the AMA motorway, the one that leads to the bridge to Sweden to eight lanes. They are planning like it is 1965, man. But then you hear them all say, oh, no, 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 no. The tunnel won't increase the number of cars in Copenhagen. It will be the opposite. It will reduce them, you know. Um, but then while we're at it, we just need to have some more money to expand all the other motorways, you know, because after we build the tunnel, there will be an increase of cars <coughs> in Copenhagen. And there are plans for a metro extension to the artificial island as well. The price is not included in that $25 billion I mentioned earlier. And you can add to that another outstanding amount. Because the existing mini metro was built too small with only three carriages, it has to be extended along with all the stations. And work needs to start by 2025 in order to be done by 2035 when capacity will be reached. And that is just based on the current structure here in Copenhagen and not even thinking about 70,000 new people on a fake island. The third thing they're spinning this as is a massive project to protect the city from rising seawaters and especially storm surges. But in the documents, and I have been looking, man, you can read how the island will contribute to coastal protection. The wording is incredibly interesting. It's not a coastal protection project. It's not storm surge protection due to climate change. It will just contribute to it. But of course, in the public debate narrative, it is hyped up. The primary goal is making land to make some money. Okay, let's look at the numbers. This artificial island is going to cost about 25 billion Danish kroner, give or take. But one thing we know for certain from all over the planet is that mega projects always go over budget. Like obscenely so. And they're never ever finished on time. But that number, that's all you're supposed to hear about in the communication from Guraham. It's a free island. That is the rhetoric we're actually hearing from politicians who obviously read the brochures from that company. It's free, they tell us, because the price of the island is going to be offset by the price of selling the properties on the island. Well, maybe, but maybe and eh, probably not. Because the properties on this island, depending on the market, are going to sell for between 12 and 23 billion Danish kroner. There is a lot of space between 12 and 23 billion. So in their communication, they are counting on getting the actual price, which is so completely optimistic that it is so completely foolish. And then we have the big stupid motorway tunnel that's going to pump more cars into Copenhagen. More roads, more cars, right? And that's going to cost about 25 billion Danish kroner. And that is a very conservative estimate. Establishing a metro line out to the new artificial island, that's going to cost about 20 billion Danish kroner as well. Give or take, depending on which of the three models they're working with, they end up choosing. The necessary upgrade to the existing metro, because they screwed up in the 1990s, that's going to cost 6 billion Danish kroner. And then there's Copenhagen's sewage treatment facility, which is right on the harbor next to where this island is supposed to go. That's going to cost 10 billion Danish kroner to move. But don't worry, if you love living near waste products, the massive garbage incinerator that some other morons built 1.5 kilometers from the Queen's Palace and the city center, that's going to stay. And we don't even generate enough garbage to fill it up, so we import garbage from the UK and Poland and other exciting places. You're welcome. But hey, don't worry. They put a ski hill on the top so you won't notice. The plans for the motorway expansion around the city is estimated at 18 billion Danish kroner. So we're up around 104 billion Danish kroner. And remember, mega projects always go over budget. And even if I'm off by 20 billion or so, this still doesn't make any sense. This is absolutely insane. There is a municipal election here in Denmark in late 2021, but this project, man, it is being hurried through the corridors of power and trying to get it all approved before that happens. Don't you think that the citizens of a city should have a voice, should be able to vote in their election about whether or not they want a massive project like this? One that is going to impact the lives of so many people in the city and 
for so many years to come. But hey, let's take a quick little walk down memory lane because Copenhagen has a long and embarrassing history of proposing massive mega projects like this one. And most of them came from the Social Democratic Party. If you like the neighborhood of Nørrebro, you should be really happy that this project didn't happen. Formlinjen. This is what it would have looked like if they had built all the motorways and basically bulldozed most of the neighborhood. Then there's the infamous Syring, the lake ring, a motorway running down the length of the lakes and leading conveniently to City Plan West, bulldozing the Vesterbro neighborhood to make room for more highways. Basically, most places that I like to drink are under that asphalt. Even back in 1911, there were plans to get rid of the canal in Newhound, that most iconic and picture-perfect part of this city, and they were going to make a tunnel. And one mega project from the 1950s actually ended up getting built. Ørsta, we've covered it here on the channel a couple of times, and that didn't work out as planned. But basically, we're just going to let the same people continue to screw up. Okay, so what could we do instead? I get asked this all the time in conversations with my colleagues, and fair enough. What are some life-size solutions? We should absolutely build a storm surge barrier at the head of the harbor. We don't need the goofy island, we can just have a barrier. And we should also do the same at the south end of the harbor that nobody talks about in the context of this project. Look at this. This is what the flooding will look like during a massive storm surge from the south in just a few years. And on the right, what it's going to look like if it happens in just 80 years due to climate change. This would cause an estimated 28 billion Danish kroner in damage if it happened. But hey, there's no real estate down there to sell now, is there? So let's not talk about that. Let's just dangle our keys in front of the baby up on the north end of the harbor. Another thing we should do is to try to get more density into the neighborhood of Nohaun, the one that's being developed at the moment, following the long proud tradition of density in Copenhagen and so many other cities around Europe. There is easily room for, I don't know, 30,000 extra homes in Nohaun if we build density instead of this weird medium American style density that they're putting their money on at the moment. And if you need some extra land, you can expand Nohound. All the infrastructure is in place. We should also invest in the 22 municipalities around Copenhagen who get zero benefit from this incredibly arrogant Copenhagen centric project. We should be investing in public transport in the greater Copenhagen region. We can use the money from all that motorway planning on trams and trains and bicycle infrastructure instead. It boggles the mind. But hey, if you fancy living in a city that is so heavily indebted and you're expected to pay off that debt as well as uh, your children in the future, a city with rising car traffic like really nowhere else in Europe and no vision from anybody to reduce it, a city with streets that are consistently over the accepted pollution levels as established by the European Union and no vision to do anything about that either, a city with, you know, just huge trucks rumbling around the streets carrying dirt for the next 30 years, well then this might just be the place for you. There is a big bag of stupid candy and these people are handing it out for free. Welcome to Copenhagen. That's it from me for today. Colville Anderson is out. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.